Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Engage and Exchange. While everyone is entering from the waiting room and a few others are joining us, I will introduce myself again. I'm Vanessa Antone, NACDL's Senior Resource Counsel, and I'll give you a few announcements that you already know by now, but just in case, and for those of us who are non-NACDL members who are joining us um, today to see some of our exclusive NACDL member benefits. Um, this program is recorded so that NACDL members and others can view it after. So just keep in mind that if you have your camera on, you will be on camera. So please everyone keep your cameras off and keep your microphone muted until later on um, if we open up the discussion and people want to join that way. So just please be mindful of that. Um, another thing to note is with Zoom, um, we're gonna be looking at some PowerPoints today in addition to hearing from the speakers. With Zoom, you can click on the little icon and get the speaker view, which will give you a better view of the speaker and presentation without seeing you know, everybody else's name who has their camera off. The other thing that is very important, one of the greatest things about the Engage and Exchange program is that we want you to engage. So please submit questions through the chat. The speakers want to hear from you. We want this to be a back and forth so you can share with everyone. If you have any problems at all doing that, feel free to shoot me an email directly and I'll make sure the speakers get your question. But yes, please do. Um, don't be shy. Um, you will get the PowerPoints also after the program. And throughout the presentation, you're going to hear talk about some resources and some other materials, and we will post links to those as well so you can access to them. So now I think the boring part is over so we can move on to the substance. Again, welcome to Engage in Exchange and thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, thank you also to both of our speakers and to Pat Cresta Savage, who I will introduce now. Um, Pat's an experienced attorney with over 20 years of advisory and courtroom experience lots of litigation experience, litigation in both the civil and also criminal defense realm. Extremely relevant to what we are doing today, she is also the leader of NACDL's Corrections Committee. And in that role, Pat has been instrumental in helping the Corrections Committee organize this series. So I will turn it over to Pat Cresta Savage with a thank you um, to talk more about the series and kick us off. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Vanessa. And it is our pleasure. And we thank the NACDL staff uh, for their support in making this happen. Um, welcome to our second webinar in our three part series on mental disabilities and corrections. As I mentioned to you last week when Elizabeth Kelly presented, it is the mission of the Corrections Committee uh, to advocate for safe and humane conditions in jails, prisons, and any other type of correctional facility. Uh, additionally, the committee promotes conditions and policies that assist inmates in their re-entry into society upon release. Regarding mental disabilities and corrections at both the state and federal level, we're currently reaching out to our NACDL affiliates to support us in this effort. We are conducting qualitative interviews uh, with up to five affiliates to gather information regarding mental health evaluation and treatment around the country. Today, this presentation will cover the policies and procedures of the Bureau of Prisons, as well as an actual case study regarding an individual who is suffering from a mental illness. It is the desire of our committee to gather additional anecdotal evidence from practitioners and clients alike on this topic, both state in both state and federal jurisdictions. You may recall that last year on March 10th, 2021, the committee presented the How to Navigate the Prison System Guide. It was about a three-year effort, and we finally put together information that is posted on the NACDL website. Uh, the guide contains much of what we'll be discussing today as it relates to mental health evaluation and treatment. The final presentation, again, will be on April 27, 2022, which, in which we'll discuss advanced psychiatric directives with Lori Hallmark. So you may direct your questions or comments by going to NACDL's website or, or reaching out to Vanessa Antoon 
and clicking on the information form uh, embedded in the site. Uh, and, and we'll be presenting that in the chat later on. Now, on to our speakers who are also been active members in our committee. Uh, many of you know them both, and I am very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Jack Donson. Many of you know him as an expert who has worked around the country. Uh, he's been working with the federally incarcerated for the past 34 years, 23 years working for the BOP as a case manager and case management coordinator. He testifies regularly in federal district courts around the country and does BOP related training for federal defender offices. Recently, he has done a lot of work supporting the, D the Washington DC IRAA, which is the uh, Senate's Reduction Act, second look and on compassionate release cases. So we welcome him. Our, our, our second speaker is Mr. Albanes, John Albanes, who you all know from NACDL. He began his time with NACDL as a volunteer attorney for the Clemency Project in 2014. Uh, through which he obtained the release of a nonviolent drug lifer uh, under President Obama's historic clemency initiative. He then became an NACDL staff attorney and screened and filed additional clemency petitions until the pro project's closure. John joined the ranks with NACDL again upon the creation of the State Clemency Project as an advisory attorney representing a man convicted of murder in his clemency bid before New York Governor Cuomo and advising volunteers on their own cases. He served on the DC Court of Appeals Criminal Justice Act panel from 2017 to two, uh, 2021, including on several compassionate release appeals. In April, 2022, he represented a, a former uh, Clemency Project 2014 client pro bono in his compassionate release bid before US District Judge Robert Pratt of the Southern District of Iowa, who granted his freedom 28 years before he was scheduled to be released. Mr. Albanes then served as resource counsel for the DC Compassionate Release Project, uh, which helped secure the release of over 30 individuals during the COVID-19 pandemic. We welcome both of you and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, and as mentioned, check the chat for the NACDL uh, website and ways to contact us. So thank you, John and Jack, take it away. Thanks, Pat. Um, I think I was gonna go first. Um, uh, let me just start up my slideshow and share my screen. Um, everybody, thank you so much for joining and uh, Pat, thanks for having me on. It's an honor to be here and um, to be helping with the Corrections Committee's very important work. Um, as Pat said, I'm the legal director of the Return to Freedom Project, which um, is an umbrella project that encompasses several post-conviction relief initiatives with several different themes, including our Cannabis Justice Initiative, which is focused on marijuana offenses, our Child Penalty Clemency Project, which is focused on individuals who exercised their right to a trial and got a more severe uh, punishment as a result, and our Compassionate Release Projects, including our Excessive Sentence Projects, which uh, revolve around unfair sentences um, for various reasons. Uh, all of these projects seek to get people out of prison as quickly as possible, um, many of whom are, of course, at risk of um, severe illness from the COVID-19 and who have other um, serious illnesses or age-related impairments. So with that being said, I'm going to start up my slideshow. And hopefully you can see that. All right, you got to see that, right? Yeah, that's great. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a state case study um, in Virginia, it, it's a state study uh, case study involving a client I represented uh, pro bono through one of our Return to Freedom projects, the Virginia Redemption Project. And I will take this case from um, the night of the offense through the um, posture that I represented the client in, which was clemency. And 
through that, kind of explore some of the challenges involved and some lessons learned as a result. So hopefully you all watching can um, get some practice pointers um, from, from this case study. And then Jack is going to talk about um, some federal uh, Bureau of Prisons programs and other um, resources available for individuals in the federal system. And we'll probably have a little back and forth as well um, just to um, exchange ideas. So with that being said, uh, here's a quote that I found and I liked it. Um, for those of you watching, you're probably well aware that you know mental disabilities are a pervasive feature of our criminal legal system. It's probably very rare that any of you will go through your criminal defense careers without representing an individual with some kind of a mental disability. Um, they are just, uh, they pervade the criminal system. And unfortunately, it is no secret that our prisons are, have kind of become a warehouse for individuals suffering from mental illness, which is not an ideal system. Um, so this quote that I found states that sometimes a person's contact with law enforcement may be the first indicator of a mental illness. Because of the stigma attendant to a mental health diagnosis, coupled with the lack of access to mental health services in many communities, either as a result of geographic isolation, sparse population, and or economic impoverishment, many individuals who have a mental disability have not been so diagnosed or treated. And many persons who are diagnosed as mentally ill have never had a full evaluation or screening. And this was um, quite similar to the case that I found um, my client in when he came to me. It was kind of a textbook example of an individual who kind of fell through the cracks and didn't receive the treatment that was required until he had his um, first run in with the police, which is not the, the situation you want to be in. Um, you want to get that treatment beforehand to avoid uh, interaction with the police, but that's the situation we found ourselves in. So the client is Mr. Annarelli. Um, he said I could talk about his case on the condition that I used his name. Um, he was a 40-year-old uh, white male with bipolar disorder and traumatic brain injury, or TBI. He suffered from childhood sexual abuse. He was bullied as a child. He had emotional disturbances growing up. Um, his parents noticed that in him as a child as well and tried to seek treatment for him, but the medication had serious side effects. And so he was removed from them as a child. He's had multiple suicide attempts. He jumped from a moving vehicle, uh, traveling over 50 miles per hour at one point from which he sustained a serious head injury um, and how he got a traumatic brain injury. Um, he has a very limited criminal history, um, non-violent. So he's not a violent individual by nature and he sought our assistance through the Return to Freedom Project. Um, so just some information about bipolar disorder and TBI, um, for those of you who don't know a whole lot about them. Um, I've also included links to other mental disabilities at the end of the slideshow for you to familiarize yourself with others, including autism and schizophrenia and other um, disabilities. But bipolar disorder um, is basically a mood disorder. It creates shifts to mood, energy, and activity levels. Um, it also impacts the ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks. Um, people can have manic phases when they're bipolar and also depressive phases, which is why it's also been termed manic depression. Um, TDI is uh, caused by an injury to the brain. It can change cognition, motor functioning, and behavior. It can have some side effects of irritability, disinhibition, and temper flare-ups, and aggression, um, and other side effects. Um, so with that being said, let's go into the offense. So on the evening of the offense, the um, Virginia State Police responded to a domestic disturbance at Mr. Annarelli's family's home. Um, he was asking erratically and actually for the several months leading up to the offense, his behavior had changed. He was increasingly irritable. His family had no need and he just wasn't himself. So on this night, he was acting out. He got into a fight with his son, and the family called the police, um, which is where things took a turn for the worse. Um, so in the house, uh, he was yelling that everybody was trying to sabotage him. He was yelling at the family dog. He had a fist fight with his son. He had been drinking, and he was armed with a shotgun. The police 
uh, arrived at the residence thinking it was a domestic disturbance and not really aware that this was really a mental health call. And they drew their guns. They were shouting at the client in a very standoff kind of Hollywood situation. They ended up breaking through the front door of the home. They kicked down the door and then they exchanged shots with the client. Um, the police say the client aimed his weapon at them first, was shot first, and they exchanged fire. But really, um, in this kind of high stakes, you know, fast paced situation, who knows what really happened. Um, the officer sustained flesh wounds. There were relatively minor injuries, actually. He did go to the hospital, but he was treated and discharged by the next day. So nothing serious at all. The client was held pre-trial and incredibly enough was handed a 20 year sentence for his first time um, violent offense. And notably the guidelines in this case with his limited criminal history call for just two to five years. So he really got the book thrown at him for this offense involving uh, a law enforcement officer. So moving on to sentencing, which is where um, things got only got worse. Um, so the client pleaded no contest uh, as he didn't have a full memory of the incident, which isn't surprising, not only given his um, disabilities, but also that he was drinking that night. He just didn't have a full memory of what occurred. There was very superficial medical testimony presented um, from a family friend about traumatic brain injury. This physician had not done an individualized assessment of the client. Um, he simply opined in general terms that people with traumatic brain injury can benefit from treatment. Um, but he didn't talk about how the injury, uh, and certainly didn't talk about bipolar disorder at all, but didn't talk about how TBI might have impacted behavior and have played a role in the offense. There was no in-depth mitigation using mental illness, no diagnosis of the client. The state evaluation actually said that there was nothing wrong with the client, um, which the defense counsel apparently accepted at face value. Don't do that. Um, the state evaluation was in inaccurate. Um, defense counsel ended up saying at sentencing that there was no way to know uh, what caused the incident. And um, unsurprisingly, the judge with probably no friend uh, to the defense to begin with, said that there was absolutely no evidence of mental health issues present in the case. And he likened the client to the Oklahoma City bomber, Timothy McVeigh, who killed over 168 people in an act of domestic terrorism. And um, we know that the US Supreme Court has said that mental illness is a very relevant mitigation at sentencing. Um, there are a couple of cases for you to cite. Unfortunately, um, defense counsel did not quite um, do as extensive an investigation as perhaps uh, he should have. So this is what uh, the judge said that the client was uh, or likened the client to, um, when in reality the client had a uh, minor gun exchange with cops who didn't even suffer serious injuries and was released from the hospital the next day. So clearly apples and oranges. But how did we get here? Well, there was a confluence of factors, and one of them was the lack of mental health mitigation presented at sentencing, because as the judge said, there's no evidence of mental health issues present in the case. So defense counsel gave the judge that out to say that there's no mitigation here, so I'm gonna treat your client really harshly. Um, so don't let the judge get away with that. Really present that mental health mitigation at sentencing. So the client um, filed a habeas petition, who was unsuccessful, but it was at this point for the first time that the client was evaluated by a different, different defense counsel. The expert opined that based on interviews with his family and with the client in reviewing the record and the case, it was very clear that uh, the client suffered from bipolar disorder and was having a manic episode on the evening of the offense and that he therefore had diminished capacity. Um, habeas was denied. Again, we, there was an unsympathetic judge. Um, the judge said that diagnosis and the expert testimony wouldn't have made a difference at the sentencing phase because the judge um, was basically so harsh to begin with. Uh, 
basically. Um, the judge said that the severity of the crime and credibility issues because of the memory loss were really the reasons why he slammed the client. And it wasn't because there were no mental health um, factors at play. So habeas didn't work out either. In the interim, uh, Virginia passed a couple of new laws on uh, mental disabilities. So there, the first one is um, they changed their criminal procedure to allow for evidence of mental um, disabilities to be uh, argued at trial um, where relevant to um, the facts. So you can argue that the mental health issue tends to show the defendant did not have the intent required for the offense and is, as long as it's otherwise admissible pursuant to the general rules of evidence. Prior to this law being passed, Virginia disallowed evidence of um, mental disability from being introduced at trial and it could be used just as sentencing. So this is a huge change that certainly could have helped this client out. Um, and an another new law, the Marcus David Peters Act, calls for crisis intervention teams to respond to mental health crises and uh, changes the role of law enforcement to hopefully avoid situations like the one that occurred in this exact case. So both of these new laws certainly would have helped the client out if it had been passed just a few years earlier. And we certainly made a note of that in our um, common petition and filed. So client's prison experience was um, certainly, on an, uh, has been an unhappy one, um, which is not surprising for anyone, but certainly not for individuals with mental disabilities who suffer much more on average than individuals who do not have these conditions. Not surprisingly, he adjusted poorly to the prison environment. He actually started his pretrial detention in solitary confinement for several months because of his suicide risk. Um, unfortunately, there was not there was no advocacy at uh, the pretrial stage um, to get a mental health treatment as far as I'm aware in the community. Um, I doubt mental health was raised at the pretrial stage either, given that it wasn't raised at all at sentencing. Um, there were a number of minor nuisance infractions that the client engaged in, which were likely byproducts of his mental disabilities. He once wrote a letter um, calling the facility the state corruption center rather than the state correctional center because of um, the diversion of funds from programs to other uh, uh, other uses that the client disagreed with. The client refused psychiatric treatment uh, in prison because he did not trust the staff, um, even though he did acknowledge his illness. This is not unusual. Um, the client heard from other inmates that the staff routinely handed out the wrong medication or the wrong dosages, and so he did not want to be the victim of um, any kind of administrative mistake on their part. He was assaulted by other inmates once in the head, which is not a great place to be assaulted if you have traumatic brain injury to begin with. And he had fairly modest programming. He did have some programming, but um, certainly nothing stand out. Um, and this is again likely to due to his disabilities and um, poor adjustment to the prison environment. So where I got involved was with clemency. Um, he filed, he sought assistance to the Virginia Redemption Project, and we filed five years into the sentence. Um, we thought filing five years in was premature, but we filed anyway due to various timing issues and also the fact that the client had served the maximum of the guidelines called for, so we thought that there was a decent shot anyway at getting him out. Um, we argued that because of the ineffective counsel at sentencing, the bad sentencing judge, who interestingly enough was actually removed from the bench um, a few years after this case due to complaints from the bar. Um, so the judge is no longer a judge. Um, we presented the mental health mitigation, the new laws that I mentioned, and the disproportionality of the sentence relative to the guidelines and his mistreatment in prison. All this mitigation was present uh, in this post-conviction relief appeal. We also mentioned the particular difficulties for individuals who suffer from uh, mental disabilities in prison, such as disciplinary issues, the difficulty engaging in programming, excuse me, and the social interactions 
um, that can often uh, be a difficult point of difficulty for these individuals, plus there's suicide risk. And we were basically saying, look, he's going to do much better in the community, getting community mental health care. We even went so far as to provide alternative um, community mental health solutions. We had a doctor write a letter that he'd be able to provide the client with treatment. We got some therapists uh, who we had spoken with who would be willing to work with him as well. Um, much better solutions than what the prison was offering, which was little to nothing. And um, the client did have, you know, relatively little children and evidence of rehabilitation, which somewhat undercut the petition. And he had some non serious infractions. Um, so the petition is still pending um, at this point in time. Um, and uh, we are just hoping and waiting for a positive result at this point. So what happened and what should have happened? Well, what happened? Um, there was no community intervention before this crisis unfolded. There were childhood warning signs, but um, you know the care that was provided didn't really stick. Um, like I mentioned, the medication, and this was in the 70s when treatment was not as robust as it is today, but the medication wasn't working. There were side effects. He was taken off of them. Um, he had his traumatic brain injury after the car fall, which certainly worsened things for him. And unfortunately, he lived in uh, you know, a relatively remote town where services were not exactly um, flowing. And he fell through the cracks and didn't get treatment before this crisis unfolded. So ideally, uh, in an ideal world, there would have been early detection and treatment. The client would have been hooked up with some community health care services. It would have helped them find a good treatment regimen that worked for him uh, to prevent this tragedy from occurring. So what happened in this case, there was a police escalation and a standoff. The police didn't treat this as a mental health crisis. It's uh, unclear whether they would have if they were aware that it was a mental health crisis anyway. Um, of course, today under this new law, ideally and hopefully, um, a crisis intervention team would have been called to the scene to de-escalate the situation and prevent the client from um, uh, reacting in a violent manner and prevent the police from, from acting in a violent manner as well. Uh, here we had very ineffective mental health advocacy or mitigation. There was no expert evaluation prepared at sentencing. The defense counsel said he didn't know why the offense occurred. That is not a situation you want to be in um, when you're advocating for a client with mental illness. You want, you want to say it is it was the mental disability that played a primary role in the offense. Um, you want to get an evaluation. You want to give the judge outs to hopefully prevent a long period of incarceration or any incarceration at all, because we know that these individuals will fare much more much uh, more poorly than their um, than their peers do in prison, and they will do much better with community mental health care. Uh, so what should have happened, of course, was a mental health evaluation with an expert should have raised diminished capacity and pre negotiations and sentencing. It sounds like there was a little bit of that done with the expert who the family friend who talked about traumatic brain injury in general, but it really wasn't the kind of robust and thorough evaluation that you really want um, in these cases. Because as the judge said, there was no evidence of mental illness in the case, and we don't want the judge to be able to say that when the opposite is true. There was no treatment in prison. The prison I learned didn't even have a record of the client's severe mental illness or SMI. I had to tell them about it um, years later. <laughs> so uh, even though the client wasn't interested in treatment, it's unlikely that the prison would have given it to him because they didn't even know he had a uh, mental health concern. And of course, what should have happened was mental health care in the community. And if it's in prison, it should be in some kind of an environment where they're receiving treatment and um, uh, hopefully programming, which Jack will talk more about. Um, so some lessons learned um, from this very unfortunate series of events is that you really need to get in there early. You know, um, when you first get this case, be aware that your client just gets interaction with the criminal justice system and maybe just a manifestation of uh, mental disability coming out. 
And so you need to get your expert in there to evaluate the client. Don't take the state's word for it that there's no, you know, mental health issue. You know, the state has an incentive in covering up any mental health issue because it's mitigation. It's going to help your client at some point. So you need to do the job as the advocate to make sure that those issues are really brought out. Um, similarly, you know, talk to family, talk to friends who know the client, ask them about the client's history. Sometimes the client might not even be completely aware of what's going on in them, um, or might be, may even be in denial. So talk to people who know the client um, and they can talk about their history. I'm not saying that was the case here, but it may be the case that your client you know, doesn't want to acknowledge that they have a uh, mental disability for whatever reason. You know, there's still a stigma involved with it. So really talk to people who know the individual to kind of get a full picture about what might have been going on in the months and the weeks leading up to the event and on the night in question. Um, so make sure you do this because the end goal is to prevent prison um, because we know that individuals with mental disabilities are going to underperform their peers in the prison environment, um, which are going to just further limit their ability to get out early through post-conviction um, mechanisms like clemency. So you want to build a strong record at the plea and the trial level. You want to get the, the expert in, evaluate the client, talk about what was animating the offense, do what the expert did in the habeas case um, here, and to say that you know if it's if it's possible to do so, that the client was um, had diminished capacity, that they weren't you know of sound mind, and that the mental disability was really causing this erratic behavior, and they shouldn't be held to the same standard as a normal functioning adult who was you know of a clear mind and who can be um, said to be really guilty and culpable here. Um, State prisons, you know, I will talk about federal prisons, but state prisons are definitely a crapshoot with respect to programming and care. Um, but we know that they're not going to offer the therapeutic environment that is needed for treatment. Um, this is particularly harmful for a client with mental illness because they are often impacted by stress differently and handle social interactions differently and are more likely to decompensate, be suicide risks, be placed in solitary confinement not get along with their peers, and the list goes on and on of the repercussions to having uh, these kinds of individuals in our correctional facilities. And if the time comes when the you know, prison is inevitable and you've done all of this and the judge is still going to throw the client into prison, hopefully for a shorter period as possible, um, you want to provide the client's mental health records to the facility Make sure the judge is aware, they should have already been made aware of this, but they can provide a recommendation for mental health treatment to the facility um, to at least get the prison uh, you know, alerted to the unique situation so that they can hopefully offer some kind of treatment if they have treatment available. Um, but again, the goal is to keep them out of prison and if they're gonna be incarcerated, keep them in there for as short as period as possible. So here are just some links, uh, tips on representing clients with mental disabilities, um, and also some links to information on mental disabilities, including some that we didn't cover today. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to field them. Um, but otherwise, I am happy to turn it over to Jeff. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, John. I made a million notes as you went through your case study because I'm going to try to when I get to the appropriate slide, make reference to a lot of things you said. One, one thing I think is needed is, is obviously this education um, and judges need this more than anything because what I try to do in my declarations and in supporting initial sentencings or compassionate release is all the context you provided, judges need to hear that before they pronounce sentence. You know, the vicious cycle of protective custody, the acting out on incident reports, which now has a direct correlation with pattern scores and, you know, extra time and all these themes should be flushed out at sentencing, to be honest with you. So judges really have a context. Um, I use the analogy all the time of I deal with a lot of juvenile lifers in D.C. that are always possession sharpened instruments. And so possession of a dangerous weapon Oh my, oh my Lord, the prosecutor, oh, look at this, your honor. But really I've had judges come around in DC to say, everybody has a, 
almost everybody has a weapon for self-protection in penitentiaries. And so the context is extremely important. So I'm not going to belabor the points, but I'll, I'll try to cover some of the elements of your case as I go through my PowerPoint. Um, if Vanessa, if you could pull that up. There we go. Before I get into uh, the be before I get into the PowerPoint, I got to set also some context as well in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. One thing you have to be conscious of is staffing levels. Uh, throughout my career, judges would recommend regular individual treatment for mental health issues. Uh, it does not happen in the Bureau of Prisons, especially in a pretrial operation. The Bureau of Prisons is not staffed for individual clinical treatment. And so, you know, fortunately, if somebody happens to be on bond and in a very regimented treatment program, especially at their own expense, you know, that, that's extremely important uh, to accentuate that regardless of the resources the Federal Bureau of Prisons has from a clinical perspective, you know, programs are delivered en masse. And in pretrial facilities, we can't lose sight of pretrial prisoners are not BOP prisoners. Uh, so they're US Marshals prisoners. You know, we used to, when I worked in a pretrial facility, we had the expression three hots in a cot. You know, we were, we were basically holding a body, feeding a body and the more regimented clinical stuff, that was simply crisis intervention, you know, suicide risk prevention and things like that. So the context is extremely important. Um, something else about context is, policy versus practice. Uh, many times uh, the defense will raise issues with BOP mental health or physical health issues. They'll fire off a letter to the Bureau of Prisons. And then what comes back is a boilerplate letter of all the wonderful policy, all the wonderful facilities, programs. And, you know, it's cut and paste stuff. I mean, I read one, I read a hundred. Uh, but what does that look like in practice? You know, the practice is obviously different. Uh, Everybody knows, especially now with the attention due to COVID and the, you know, all the, the class actions and the depositions, people are really seeing what happens behind our, our, our prison fences and our prison walls. So from a pretrial perspective on remand, you know, you have medication issues right from the get-go. Um, BOP publishes what's referred to as a formulary. Um, and Vanessa, you can go to the next slide now. The BOP has what they refer to as a formulary. And if... A person arrives in a federal prison and is on a non-formulary medication, immediately they are going to substitute. Uh, so I'll get back to the policy. Is there a policy for non-formularies? Absolutely. Is it approved? In my experience, most of the time requests for non-formularies are denied. And so you just got to be conscious of very basic things like is right off the bat the medication regimen going to be interrupted? So just to know there's a formulary on the BOP website. Um, anybody could go access it. And it's important uh, as you move through the process in a typical pre-sentence investigation, you wanna have, um, and, and you can go back, but I'm sorry, Vanessa, you can go back. I'm still gonna cover that first slide a little more. You, uh, oh, actually, no, you're, you're, you're good, I'm sorry. But from a pre-trial, from a pre-sentence perspective, you wanna have in the pre-sentence report, the diagnosis, the medication unit, uh, the dosage, the, the diagnosis, the dosage for the BOP in writing, 100%. Um, and if, I'm, I apologize, Vanessa, can you go back one slide? I, I apologize. Studies, most people don't realize that, uh, Jonathan, or John, what you had said is that there was no diagnosis. Well, the, fortunately, the federal government has the resources, judges could order studies. Uh, when I worked in a pretrial facility, we did studies. So they do the, you know, different studies under the law, which is a little outside my skill set, the various, you know, 4241, 4242, you know, federal practitioners are aware of those studies, which is a very good thing. Um, also, from a pretrial -pre perspective, the national policy, which I have the link right here, is important to read. That's like a soup to nuts uh, pretrial policy for every aspect of pretrial uh, confinement. So it's very important. And if you see the two isolated quotes I have taken out of there, you know, 
this is where I get this is where I get into policy versus practice. Staff shall provide the pretrial inmate with the same the same level of basic medical, psychiatric, and psychological care provided to convicted inmates. You know, unfortunately, that's just not true in practice. Uh, you know, and then it is important those staff do notify the marshals and actually the court and the marshals about inmate medication, which may change behavior. They're, they're two part and elements of that pretrial policy. Uh, when we're talking staffing, um, a typical medium facility of a thousand, say a thousand prisoners is approximately four clinicians. Now, four clinicians for a thousand people, and actually usually it's more like 1200 people, they're delivering out programs and services. They're doing staff employee assistance program stuff. They're teaching annual training. Uh, and so like when you're talking that many clinicians in that kind of environment, there is obviously no individual clinical, you know, regular kind of treatment. And next slide, please. From an intake perspective, the BOP has what's called a psychological intake screening questionnaire. And I encourage everyone to look at that. Uh, you can click on these links. These are active links. I'm not going to go through them. We don't have the time for this presentation, but it shows you an example of what happens upon intake. Uh, inmates receive a medical screening, a social screening. The psychological screening in person does actually not happen for one to two weeks unless there's some kind of issues raised from the other intake screening people. But they do fill out an intensive psychological intake screening questionnaire that becomes the foundational document for the Bureau of Electronic Records. And so uh, it's, it's really important to know that. And that's when we're going into things like psych alert. Uh, once established in the system at intake, people with uh, maybe suicide risk or that present different mental health issues, the BOP actually has a good tracking system as far as keying in a psych alert. I always say there's nothing stopping as much data to go into a pre-sentence or even a letter, individual letter going upon remand of someone to just let the BOP know, put them on notice that the data that you're sending gets uploaded into, medic, into the medical records, including you know, the medication regimens and things like I said before. Advanced directives, the, we've been meeting about psychological advanced directives. The BOP policy is clear on advanced directives, uh, living wells, things like that. Uh, there's the concept now of a psychological advanced directive. Again, there's nothing stopping a person from having psychological advanced directives sent in right from intake screening in the beginning in a pretrial operation. Now, the caveat I'm going to talk about is pretrial operation could be non-federal. You know, we have our MDCs, our MCCs, uh, but then again, a major I, I don't know if it's a majority, but a substantial amount of people are incarcerated in county jails and private facilities from the, for the marshals on a contract status. I think some things people overlook from that perspective is marshals have policy too. Marshals have agreements, memorandum of understandings, contracts. And so it's almost like, you know, you can't just wash your hands, oh, it's a marshal prisoner. You know, they have protocols, they have policy, they're on the internet. Uh, I periodically deal with people in marshals contracts and you just have to be aware of what's out there in, in writing as far as their care. Uh, next slide, please. Designations is interesting. Uh, everybody always hears about the care levels in the BOP, care level one through four, you know, care level one, healthy, care level four terminal to be you know, dramatic. Uh, but there's also psychological care levels. And this, the care levels are determined by the pre-sentence report. Uh, a lot of people don't realize individual psychological evaluations and assessments are, are seldom, if at all, actually loaded into what's called the EDES database when they're processing designations. And so you want to send those reports targeted into Grand Prairie. You want to see, you know, the best case scenario to me is a responsive probation department uh, that would actually upload it into the EDES system because they have that capabilities. But other than that, the pre-sentence, uh, the designation people are looking at a pre-sentence, a sentencing order, and what's called a U.S. Marshals 129 form to process designations. You want to give them as much information as you can because they are determining the physical and mental health care levels. Uh, important about the, the, actually the care levels uh, is basically, it's, it's what's called non-provisional. 
which means it's not really permanent until they arrive at the facility and then they get an intake screening, a physical assessment, and then it's made provisional. Uh, ordinarily care level three and four, they're going to a medical center. And so when I'm doing a declaration, especially if the per person would be, just say the person is a camper, you describe, uh, this is where I'm gonna say John's case, describe no criminal history. Uh, basically a case like that, you, you could paint a picture with the court that BOP medical fac centers are administrative facilities that have high security level inmates. And so to be honest with you, people with no or limited uh, prison experiences really do not do well in medical center environments. It's cell living, it's highly controlled, and it's a mix of all security levels. So that's important that the court be aware. Somebody, because there's only maybe six male uh, federal medical centers in the country, somebody could be going from New York to do their time, you know, a thousand miles from home for medical treatment in a high security environment. I mean, what does that do for people that have uh, diagnosis with, with various mental illness? It, it's not a it's going to be like doing two days for one as far as mitigation goes. Uh, something tricky when we're talking about designation is often I see uh, counsel make recommendations, but you have to be careful making a recommendation without knowing the classification. It's not that hard to guesstimate a classification. The worksheet is there. The manual is there. It might seem like a daunting task initially, However, believe it or not, it's not that hard. So if you sit down with the manual, you sit down with a worksheet, you could get a rough idea. And the bigger point is you'll, you'll, you can learn it fairly quickly and maybe someday in the future we'll do a seminar on, on classification. But you really wanna know the classification before you make a facility recommendation because the, the recommendation should be commensurate with the classification needs and the program needs. So 51.8, 51, 51 is the is the like the Bible of classification. It, it, it's not that difficult of a read. Um, First Step Act. You know, I'm going to talk a little bit about programs. John, you made me think of a program for that person with TBI. There's a skills program. They have it at Danbury for low security, and they have it. And this is for males, and they have it at Mariana medium security. And so there are two programs. I mean, that's that's one program that comes to mind in two different locations of the country to deal with people with cognitive issues. And so we will talk about that a little bit. There's a I initially had in this PowerPoint two directories. People that follow the BOP pretty routinely are aware of the National Programs Directory. It's been around since 2017. They recently removed that from the website. And although I have July 21 uh, on this presentation right now, actually in January of 21, the first step back approved programs guide and productive activities has been updated. And that will be updated periodically as they add programs under the first step back. Um, so psychology department, I talked a little bit about staffing levels, and there's not a lot of staffing, but the foundational uh, policy about uh, staffing in the BOP is driven by the psychology programs manual. Early in my career, believe it or not, even then when we were a progressive agency, I say we, a retired VOP, we had a lot of staffing. We had a lot of good things going on. And the, the staffing guidelines then in the manual were a lot more beefier than they are now, even though we didn't follow them. When they re revised that manual years ago, they, they reduced staffing guidelines. And again, facilities are not staffed for regular individual counseling. It's programs on mass you know, preferably some of the more uh, high profile programs, everybody knows RDAP that are, that are really carried out in a, a residential therapeutic community. Um, next, next slide. So speaking of programs, I said skills from the beginning. Skills is what I think of, and I've had clients in the skills program. I've sent people to the skills program. Skills program, I'm, I'm fairly impressed with skills program from clients I had recently that really did a lot of vocational type programming and skills. Um, also to be aware, when I talked about classification, the Bureau of Prisons could take someone outside their classification with what's called a management variable. Um, so they could, there's one called program participation. So they could take a medium, put them in a low, low and a medium. I worked a case that was a medium 
that I determined, and we wanted to get them into Danbury, into the skills in the Northeast. We didn't want to send them from the Northeast to Florida. And the Bureau of Prisons actually, because of a carefully worded judicial recommendation, placed them into the skills program in the Northeast. So it's like those little policy nuances. When you're reading the manual, you'll pick up on those little the, those little nuances. And then these are the programs. When I refer to the 2017 manual, these programs are continued. They're still in the new manual for First Step Act programs, but these are the more intensive residential thera therapeutic community-based programs. And these have been around a long time. Um, I've visited stages programs and in, in, um, I visited challenge programs. You know, these are no different than the residential drug abuse treatment program. That gets all the fanfare, you know, they're 500 hours ordinarily, they're not all 500 hours, but it's just, you know, residential therapeutic community fun, um, philosophy. Okay, now, interesting, this is hot off the press. I spoke to a BOP warden actually earlier today, and I updated this uh, slide. They're actually constructing a new mental health unit in the Allenwood complex, and they're calling it a, um, a special administrative unit, <laughs> as if we had no between the ADX and the SMU and the reintegration units and the CMU communication management units, the BOP and their infinite wisdom is constructing a, a special administrative unit. that's basically for mental health. I, I, it was described to me as a, a shoe made up of people with mental health issues and diagnoses, but with clinicians. So it's, it's, it's just another, another program, I guess, uh, that they're, you know, coming up with no policy yet, but it's under construction as we speak. Transitional care units. Um, I, I was lucky enough to visit the secure mental health unit at Allenwood. Uh, that is an impressive operation, in my opinion. And there's, that was the pilot in Allenwood, and then they created one in Atlanta. And they are really in, uh, intense, uh, unfortunately, it's severe mental health issues. People are not free to roam everywhere they go. They're in, they're in handcuffs and leg irons and uh, they have incentives. If you wake up in the morning and brush your teeth, you get a Snickers bar, things like that. They're really incentive laden programs to cause people to get back into a routine. The goal to get them to what's called the transitional care unit in the same complex, but it'd be like one step before they go back to a penitentiary setting. It's almost like the step-down program that you have at Florence ADX and the various units at Florence. So anyway, um, important point on this, this is more like a practice tip um, when we're talking the programs and the first step back programs. If anybody's ever heard of the SPARC 13, it's the uh, 13 needs and risk assessments uh, that the BOP loads under the first step back. This is actually, I've been writing about this for a while now. We're talking about the federal time credits and the incentives for that. If your clients have a refusal in any one of the 13 needs and risks that they loaded with the SPARC 13, it is automatically prohibiting the awarding of the extra time under the first step back credits. There are literally 20 to 30,000 people in the country right now that have a refusal in one or more of the 13 uh, needs and risk areas. And that is simply because some of the, at least five of the 13 were self-assessments sent to the population on TrueLinks. And if they have not uh, filled out that assessment on TrueLinks and submitted it, they are automatically being refused and it automatically prohibits the, the good time. So pass that word, I've been writing about it. That's extremely important. No, no FSA credit if it's uh, any one of those areas has a refusal in it. Next slide. This is a little few quotes from the disciplinary policy. Believe it or not, I never encourage administrative remedies, but when I see administrative remedies do work, it's usually on a disciplinary uh, issues. Now, sometimes they're just remanded back down until, uh, you know, and the same result happens all over again when they clean up the administrative errors. But when it comes to people with a, a mental illness or a diagnosis, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, there are outs for some of the behavior that's caused. John, you mentioned your client with the, with the behavior issues, you know, putting somebody in isolation, they act out. 
you know, they act out, they get incident reports. But if you could document the record that the person has a diagnosis and you could attribute it to the behavior, you know, it's worth appealing some of these disciplinary issues. And these are the types that I have seen remanded back down and I have seen them expunged and I have seen people found, quote, not responsible. You'll see the entry once in a while on a disciplinary chronological. And so just be aware it's out there. Some of this comes from CFR. Some of this comes from the disciplinary policy. And some of this comes from some of the psychological related policies, the psychology related policies that I have at the end of this presentation. So next slide. Just a few more quotes uh, from the policy. Uh, basically, person is not responsible for their conduct at a time of the conduct resulted in a severe mental disease or defect. Listen, that's diagnosed by Beamer. I think I omitted going over the various databases, but Beamer is the Bureau of Electronic Medical Records. PDS is called the Psychological Data System. PDS was incorporated into Beamer recently. People that have been in prison a long time will have actually records on both systems. Now they're integrated, but you know, if you're trying to appeal something and coming up with a diagnosis, all the diagnoses are keyed on the PDS within Beamer. And so there is a way of really getting to the bottom of this because people in prison have access to their uh, PDS records, to be honest with you. PDS is, uh, can be given to the person. And I know people think the BOP is obstructionist and you know, uh, there's good reason to have that perception, but you have to understand the clinicians they're far and above the average staff member. They are clinicians. You know? So I find that sometimes in the PDS notes, clinicians go out of their way to document things that they really don't want to communicate face-to-face -face with the typical custodial staff. I had a case recently where somebody was bounced out of the RDAP program, lost a year off, and then the clinician put in the, in the PDS treatment notes uh, extremely, uh, I think the wording was something like, uh, strongly encouraged to re-enroll in six months. You know, she was basically saying, re-enroll in this in six months, this will all go back to normal. And the person had enough time to complete that and it was a good outcome. So, so to me, PDS treatment notes, I call gold, especially if I'm doing a declaration on a resentencing, um, th there's a lot of value sometimes in PDS treatment notes. And then down below is two links for, you know, restrictive housing is a new buzzword. I don't know how many years now they've been using restrictive housing. That's a more general term. So when somebody with a mental illness goes into a uh, shoe setting or any other restrictive housing unit setting, there's actually targeted forms to be filled out for that. And I do, I do encourage people to click on these links, look at these forms, get your head around what's out there as far as a tracking purpose and mechanism. Next slide. Reentry issues. This is big too. Uh, people need a psych, a psychological and a medical clearance to participate in RRC placement. And then you have the issue of DEA controlled substances. I put a link to the actual form that's filled out. Now everything is done through email and sent to the residential reentry manager. But you know, sometimes a diagnosis will prohibit RRC placement. To me, that's mitigating. Uh, Halfway houses, RRCs are contracts. They're, they're, they're not bound to take anybody. If they perceive somebody as a liability, then they're not going to accept them, is my experience. And so you can't assume somebody's going to go to the halfway house. And again, that becomes mitigating it, even at a sentencing, if there is a chance that at the end of the road, they're not going to make the halfway house. And so I have the, two of the foundational forms uh, links there. One is the actual referral form. And one is the um, medical psychological clearance from the, from the doctor and from the psychologist. They're important to look at as well, because uh, probably an important point on this is many times staff will tell somebody, oh, we put you in for eight months halfway house, you only got four. Well, believe it or not, that second form there, the 210, many times when we've gotten a hold of that form, they never put the person in for what they said, to be honest with you. And so it's a way of fact checking the sincerity of staff, especially if somebody has a short placement and it just, it just seems a little fishy. Um, supervision release plan. Uh, probation has mental health experts, uh, believe it or not. There's not a really good communication between the BOP and probation as far as aftercare. 
you know, they do a standard supervised release plan form, send it out. Not a lot of details, not a lot of space. There's nothing stopping a person, an attorney, any an advocate from contacting probation to try to funnel somebody into a mental health caseload. You know, that's that's what they're there for. They're a higher pay grade. They're more specialized in some degrees. They are cl clinical. And so you want to make sure your client is supervised by the right type of a probation office, um, mental health specialist. Next slide. Okay, I know I talk fast. <laughs> Hope there's a good question and answers. I talk fast. I wanted to get through this. Uh, these are, I, I talked about some of these policies above. These are your foundational uh, psychology related program statements at the top. And something else down below, links. The BOP has in the medical section of the website, the BOP has got a wonderful website. I always hear it's a horrible website. Wonderful website if you learn how to navigate it. Uh, maybe practice tip on that is if you're looking for a policy or a form, the black links at the top, they don't look like links. It just looks like text. If you click on number or you can run it by number, you can, sometimes you'll have a name, you click it by name and you can realign the order that the policies and the, and the forms actually populate in that screen. But anyway, in the, in the mental health section of the website, down a few layers, there's great clinical guides. They have the guides to the care levels for mental and physical health. A lot of clinical, there has to be 20, 30 clinical guides. And here's some important ones relative to mental health treatment. And so with that, I believe, Vanessa, this is the last slide and I'd love to entertain some questions and I probably didn't cover all your cases from John, all the, all the notes I had from your case, I probably didn't cover, but we could maybe talk about that as questions and answers come up. So I, I don't see any questions and I welcome you now to present your questions. I have a comment and then a question. And the comment uh, is this, it seems to me when both of you were talking that the psychiatric advance directive, if it's done in advance, can follow the individual through the system. And it would be really helpful to advise clinicians and staff along the way as to what the needs are. Now, I know both Jack and John, you've been working on compassionate release cases. Judges often hang their hats on discipline records. And, and don't take into account that the individual has mental health issues or has not been treated the way that they should or received the evaluation and treatment that they should. Uh, that's one thing. And secondly, the other thing they say is your re-entry plan isn't what it should be. It's not as comprehensive. So the elephant in the room is how do we as practitioners control that process? You mentioned court orders, uh, this is a multi, multi-faceted multi question, but you mentioned court orders. I think as practitioners, we have to have make sure the courts are very clear on what they're ordering, both pretrial and post. And then uh, secondly, uh, hopefully we can help our clients navigate the process, including not only during evaluation and treatment, but also re-entry. So what, what guidance would you provide to practitioners on that? Uh, I'm glad you mentioned reentry, And I mean, this is an important in compassionate release, certainly, but it can also play a role in, you know, a pretrial detention decision or a clemency decision um, or even a sentencing decision, which is provide the decision maker with an alternative um, you know, a stable environment, an alternative solution to incarceration. And so what we did with the clemency petition and what, you know, a good advocate should do in earlier stages of the proceedings as well, uh, or in compassionate release is to say, here's what the client is, here's where the client is gonna get, you know, his or her treatment in the community. Here's the doctor, here's the healthcare facility. Here's what they're gonna do with their time. You know, here's their family support. Here's who they're gonna live with and have a very concrete re-entry plan so that the judge or whoever can feel confident in letting the client out back into the community where they're going to have that support. Um, because oftentimes, um, you know, what is holding the judge back or whoever back from letting them out is that concern that they're gonna go out and they're going to re-offend, right? When we know, you know, that 
probably very unlikely because it was a confluence of factors that resulted in this kind of perfect storm uh, on this one occasion, you know, that led to the incident to begin with. Um, but we know with treatment and with support, it's very unlikely to recur. And the studies have shown that treatment is, you know, really important to reducing recidivism and does in fact reduce recidivism significantly. Um, so have that reentry plan in your at the efforts of whatever stage of the proceedings, you know, that alternative to incarceration. Um, and Pat, you also mentioned, mentioned discipline. You know, when you're talking about discipline and compassionate release, yes, you're right. The judges like to say, oh, he has these nine infractions. Two of them were violent or most of them are nonviolent or whatever. And they like to really put a lot of weight on those infractions. Well, first of all, everybody gets, almost everybody gets infractions in prison. It's really hard to go through particularly a long prison Sentence without getting them. Um, so I question how important they really are. But you have to tell, explain to the judge that your client's mental disability played a role in them getting those infractions, probably. You know, particularly like nonviolent ones that involve behavioral issues like um, insolence or, you know, not, not standing for account. You know, what if your client is still, you know, passed out because his medication is still kicked in and he wasn't able to wake up on time or something like that. And that was the reason why he w wasn't up to count. Or perhaps the insulin infraction, you know, um, maybe he wasn't getting doesn't get along well with other people and has difficulty with social interaction because of the mental disability. So all of these infractions should be contextualized with the decision maker in whatever vehicle you're advocating through, whether it's compassionate release or clemency or even at you know, sentencing, if there have been some issues pre-trial during pre-trial detention, um, so that the judge is aware of just how much the mental disability impacts this person's, you know, day-to-day -day life. Jack, Jack, do you have anything to add to that regarding? Well, uh, from a prison perspective, obviously, you know, I, I believe there was a point in time when I think judges weren't as in tune to the, especially even in DC, to the context of behavior as they are now, because repetitive, all these emotions, petitions, I mean, literally, some people have 30, 40 incident reports, you know, and, and uh, but I don't like to get into the weeds of individual incidents or try to justify an incident. I kind of just like to set the general context, you know, you're down 35 years, okay, you have 20 reports, but only four of the greatest severity and only one of those is aggressive or assaultive related. And you just kind of generally contextualize things. Some judges are still stubborn and think it's a big deal when people are possessing sharpened instruments. And to me, it's, you know, it, it's very clear. The documentation's there, the GAO reports, the DOJ IG reports, it's, it's self-protection in a penitentiary, not hard sell. Uh, it, what's more difficult is to justify violent acts of serious assault you know obviously you know you look at those things the best thing you could do on something like that is is recency and then sometimes you might want to get into the weeds i had you know it's it's famous the bop is famous for you know like an inmate brushing up against a staff member in a heated altercation and then five people slam them they end up in the hospital they're charging the inmate with assault that's a very common thing believe it or not now with cameras around everywhere, it's not as prevalent as it was in my earlier career, but I'm telling you, you know, I even worked a DC lifer lately. He ended up getting a settlement from the agency, same scenario, you know, they pummeled him, injured him, and he won the lawsuit really. But anyway, not to digress. So I have one uh, question for Jack and, and I don't, because I don't see any other questions from the audience, but I'm curious. You mentioned that pretrial, the authority over pretrial is the U.S. Marshal Service. Under 18 U.S.C. 4241, that you can you can have the court order a mental evaluation and commitment. Is there a disconnect because it is the Marshal Service? And what do you think that in fact an individual does get the appropriate evaluation and commitment early on in the process? Absolutely. When the when the that's an order. The order comes down in a pretrial facility, whatever study it may be, 42, 41, 42, 43, whatever it is. Very not 
real common, but even with the limited staffing we had with clinicians, our, our psychologists would get the order and they're very tight time frames. They were, I, don't quote me on this, it's been many years, but it'd be like a 30 or 60 day time frame turnaround for our clinicians. And I remember when I was a new case manager and being trained, and then when I trained case managers, it was like talking about the studies and the role we played as case managers in the whole process. Uh, you know, we would notify the medic medication issues. We would notify the disciplinary issues. And so the first thing I was told on that particular issue with, with uh, uh, it's funny, a particular issue with um, studies was the first thing you do on a study is ask for an extension, you know? <laughs> and this is like day one. This is the clinician saying, you know, there's only two of us here. It's a thousand people, you know? And uh, first thing you do is ask for an extension, you know? And that was uh, funny, you know, it was uh, comical. Later in my career, I didn't see them as much being performed by BOP clinicians. I do saw them more being performed like they are now by contract clinicians. Now with the C, the feds have the money, then maybe the CJA panel people, whoever, who's ever doing them, I'm not noticing they're done by BOP clinicians in a long time, but they still could be. The policy is still reads the same way. So my experience in, in my cases, the clients often understand very well how to navigate the system. But if you have a mental health issue uh, or a mental disability, then it becomes more difficult, wouldn't you say, to, to navigate the system? Absolutely. Right, and, and that's where I think their advocates come in and, and uh, including uh, crisis intervention and uh, treatment. Are there any parting words that either of you wanna say uh, and, is most of this in the how to navigate the prison system guide, hopefully? I would say a majority of the links are in the prison guide and I'll double check if they're not. Um, you know, parting words for me, uh, I guess I'm disappointed I didn't get more questions. <laughs> Usually the BOP is such an unknown entity, there's lots of questions. So um, it's good though, it's all good. Well. I know that um, you mentioned, oh, when, I do have one other question and that's on solitary confinement. Uh, do, are you finding when an individual has a mental health issue that the, the often go to uh, resources, solitary confinement, which is totally unfortunate? Well, listen, let's take, it came up, I think, I don't know if it came up in John's case. People with, people with risk for suicide end up in special housing unit. now. I have to draw a distinction because you know this has been going on for many, many years. The BO, and again, I'm not a BOP apologist, but other than Florence ADX, and actually with the special management unit in phase one, the BOP does not practice solitary confinement as in isolating one person. A protective custody case will be alone until they determine if they could be safely housed with somebody. Um, you know, Florence ADX, that's baked in the cake. You have single cell living in Florence ADX, the control unit and the various, the terrorist unit, and, you know, they're all single cell. But by and large, somebody with mental health issues will, will be housed with somebody. If they go to protective custody, if, and if they're on a formal suicide watch, they will not be with anybody, but they will be under direct 24 seven observation staff wise, sometimes even staff and cameras. But the BOP doesn't really practice solitary confinement other than those isolated incidents. and. Uh, it is a vicious cycle. People locked up in special housing unit, even if they're with one other person, they act out, they flood cells, they won't come to the door to cuff up. They, you know, they're, they're, it's a vicious cycle. Incident report, lots of good time, acting out. You know, it, it's very, very vicious. Transfer. Um, now they have reintegration units trying to get virtual protectual custody people out to regular mainstream facilities. They literally have, I wanna say two or three quote, reintegration units that they created as a pilot many years ago. So anyway, but, but that's my take on that in general. Yeah, and I can speak a little bit on solitary from my client's experience, which is that um, because he was deemed a suicide risk, he was placed in solitary pre-trial for a number of months, which was an inordinate amount of time. It was just absolutely inhumane. Um, you know, two weeks should probably be around the maximum. And then, um, you know, in prison later on, he was also placed in solitary. And in the course of representing him, 
you know, there were concerns about, you know, his, you know, wellness and his stability. Um, and we ended up finding a compromise to avoid him going back into solitary because it's an extraordinarily unpleasant experience. You know, you have, you know, hardly any clothing on you. Um, you know, you're, you're by yourself. It's a very sparse environment. And, um, you know, you're constantly being watched. It, it's just a terrible experience. So rather than risk that happening again, I, you know, suggested a solution which involved perhaps someone checking on him or him having, um, you know, more company so he wouldn't be by himself. Just kind of, you know, so solutions that didn't go as far as solitary, which is a very, you know, traumatizing experience for some people. So, particularly for an individual with a mental disability. Well, thank you, um, Jack and John, for your hard work and your insight. We also appreciate all the work that you've been doing with the Corrections Committee. Thank you, Vanessa, for posting in the chat this, uh, the link to the state of prison and jail communications, as well as the how to navigate the federal system guide, uh, both of which are invaluable in, in, in communicating with your client and how to navigate the uh, infamous BOP system. Um, and so we appreciate it. And we look forward to feedback from through our states and uh, uh, federal uh, members. And I'll hand it back to you, Vanessa. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you to both of our excellent speakers. It was a wonderful presentation and I really appreciate it. I want to thank you on behalf of all of our members and all the others who are watching and all those who are going to watch later when we post this recording along with the resources.